Welcome to my favorite lesson about ambiguity, lesson 16. And ambiguity is the result of a sentence having multiple interpretations or more than one meaning. Uh, there's such a thing called lexical ambiguity when a word has more than one meaning. For example, Martha cannot bear children. The verb bear can mean to give birth or to tolerate, and therefore the sentence is ambiguous. It has two possible meanings. Either Martha cannot give birth to children, or Martha cannot tolerate children. Now, the structure of a sentence may also cause ambiguity, and it's not really the words then that have different meanings, but structural ambiguity results when the phrases of a sentence can be assembled in more than one way. Now, let me give you an example, and I'll do this quickly because I have a lot of examples to go through. We could be here for quite a while if we analyze every sentence all the way through. But right off the bat, can you see two different meaning, possible meanings for this sentence? Manny saw the child with the binoculars. I think one way to look at it is that the child had the binoculars. And so the child with the binoculars is one phrase. It happens to be the object in this sentence. It's a noun phrase. And with the binoculars is actually a modifier of the child. Now, it's also possible to think well, Manny had the binoculars, and that's why he could see the child. Maybe the child was far away. If that's the w interpretation, then the child is the object, and with the binoculars is the complement in that sentence. So, this is what I mean about having different ways to interpret or to to give places and to attribute places to phrases. This is called parsing, where as we hear a sentence or read it, we give, we assign places or roles or functions to the different words in a sentence. So let's take a look at the next sentence. Macy's had a big earring sale, and there are two ways to interpret this. Stop the video and take a look and see if you can show how can this sentence be understood two different ways. I think the first interpretation, the first parsing, can be sale is the noun phrase head. This is the object in the sentence. A is a determiner, big is an adjective phrase modifier, earring is a noun phrase modifier, and it means that Macy's had a big sale, and the sale was on earrings. Now, a second way to interpret this sentence would be making sale the head. It's still going to be the object. A is a determiner, big earring is one phrase, it's a noun phrase, and then we would need to rewrite it, big earring, where earring becomes the new noun he phrase head, and big is the adjective phrase modifier, and this second parsing means that Macy's had a big, had a sale, and the sale was on big earrings. Take a couple minutes, look at the next sentence, the tuna, and find two ways to analyze this sentence that will create different meanings. When you're ready, come back. Okay, 
So my first way to do it would be to say can is the X word. The tuna is the subject. Here's my predicate. So the tuna may be able to hit the boat or they may hit the boat. The second interpretation would be the X word is did. Did the tuna can hit the boat? The tuna can did not hit the boat. And now we're talking about a tuna can, not a fish. Let's try another couple. They are hunting dogs. Please take a couple minutes and let's analyze this two different ways to have two different meanings. Okay. The first way would be R is the X word, they is the subject, hunting dogs, and R ties with they, R ties with present, R ties with the verb hunting, it's the ing form, Y is a verb phrase, no time, and this means that some people are out trying to catch or hunt dogs. Another interpretation would start with the X word R, the subject V, the predicate, so far, things look exactly the same, except in the second interpretation or analysis, there, are, there is no more ties. So, hunting dogs is Y, and hunting dogs is a noun phrase. And now, we're saying that these are the kinds of dogs that are bred specifically for hunting. So by parsing it differently, I create a different meaning from the same words. Please take a couple minutes. Someone photographed the driver of the actress on the balcony. How can we analyze this sentence two different ways? Okay, so I won't go through the whole thing, but let's just really focus our attention here on the object of the sentence, the driver of the actress on the balcony. Driver is the head of the actress on the balcony is a modifier. And now as I analyze it down further and I come to the object of the preposition, the actress on the balcony, I see that actress is the head, and on the balcony is a modifier, prepositional phrase, that says something about the actress. That's where the actress is. And someone photographed the driver of this actress who was on the balcony. Now, the second interpretation is still the driver of the actress is the object, just like it was here, and on the balcony is the complement. So, someone photographed the driver of the actress, and the photograph was taken on the balcony. That's the complement. And so you can see, by just thinking about the structure differently, we come up with a quite different meaning. Please take a couple moments and analyze this sentence. The ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind. And let's find two ways to do this, to analyze this sentence, so we come up with two different meanings. The ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind. So I'm going to say in my first analysis, 
Do the ladies of the church have cast-off clothing? The ladies of the church do not have cast-off clothing. Have is the verb. It ties with the subject. It ties with the present. And okay, to make it quick, let me just rewrite the why. Have cast off clothing of every kind. The verb is have. There is no particle. And cast off clothing of every kind is the object. It's a noun phrase. Cast off clothing of every kind. And clothing is the head. Cast off clothing is a modifier. Looks like a verb phrase, no time. And of every kind is a modifier, prepositional phrase. So perhaps these women work in a thrift shop. And when you go in there, you see that they have pants and jackets and skirts and dresses and just clothing of every kind. And cast off means that it's been thrown out or used or been given away. Now, what's the second interpretation, the second way to analyze this sentence? Here's what I would do. Have becomes my X word. The ladies of the church is the subject. The predicate. The X word ties with the subject, with the present, and with the verb, the DTN form. Here we had verb phrase, this is no S form, with time. And here we have DTN form, verb phrase, no time. Now, what does this mean? Let's take a look. We'll rewrite the Y. Have cast off clothing. of every kind. And now we have the verb, the particle, and clothing of every kind is the object. Complement place is empty. The second analysis really means that the women have taken off all of their clothes. So actually it's uh, quite a different interpretation. Let's continue. Please take a look at the next pair. She earned little as a whiskey maker, but he loved her still. And let's find two different ways to interpret or to analyze this sentence to come up with different meanings. Come back when you're ready. She earned little as a whiskey maker, but he loved her. We can see we have a compound sentence. And to make this quick, the real difference comes here in this little end part of the sentence. Now let me show you what happens if I take the Y and I rewrite it, loved her still, and analyze it like this. Verb, no particle, Object, noun phrase, still, complement, adverb phrase. This means that he continued to love her. Now, let me do it a different way. Let's take the same group of words from Y. and analyze it like this. Verb is loved, no particle, and the object is her still. 
That's a noun phrase. The complement place is empty. Now, in the second interpretation, with her still as a noun phrase object, it means that he loved the apparatus that she used to make her whiskey, because that's what a still is. It's just like a kind of a machine for making alcohol. Okay, well, let's take a look. So in the future, when you have a, a little ambiguity in your sentences, you'll be able to explain it probably pretty well. Let's take a look at the next one. The butcher backed into the meat grinder and got a little behind in his work. So, stop the video, analyze this sentence two different ways so that we can get two different meanings. Okay, here we go. Now, we don't really have to analyze the whole sentence to find where the ambiguity is. The ambiguity, in my opinion, is right over here at the end. So let me rewrite this. And, you know, what we have here is we have the subject, and then we have compound y's. Here's one y, verb phrase with time. And here's our second y, verb phrase, whoop, verb phrase with time, past forms. And here is where we have the ambiguity. Got a little behind in his work. Now, one way to analyze it is the verb and got a little behind in his work, no particle, no object. The complement is an adverb phrase. So it really means that he backed into the meat grinder and somehow that slowed down the work for him. Maybe he injured himself or he broke the grinder, but he started to fall behind in his work, and so he couldn't get much done, and he didn't get enough done. Now, there is a second way to analyze it. The same piece can be looked at a little bit differently. And let's rewrite it. Got a little behind in his work. Now, God is the verb. There's no particle. But what I'm going to do is call a little behind the object. In his work, the complement, prepositional phrase, noun phrase. And when I think about it as a noun phrase, a little behind, I really mean that I'm thinking about his butt. So he backed into the machine. And he somehow got his, uh, you know, that part of his body caught in the machine. So you can see there's two ways to look at this. Please, let's analyze the next one. A hole was found in the nudist camp wall, and the police are looking into it. Again, I think that all of the ambiguity lies right over here at the end of our sentence. And I'll explain to you how I understand this. A hole was found in the nudist camp wall and the police are looking into it. Here is our why. It's a verb phrase. No time. Let me rewrite the why. Looking into it. I'm going to analyze it. Verb, particle, object is a noun phrase, and the complement place is empty. Now, this kind of interpretation means the police are investigating this hole. Did somebody put it there? Was it an accident? Has it always been there? 
but looking into is an expression that I make with the verb and the particle. It really means investigating. Now here, in the second way to analyze it, it's the same group of words in their, in both, they're, they're both in the Y to begin with, but let's see what happens when I put some of these words into different places. Now in my second analysis, looking is the verb, the particle place is empty, the object place is empty, and into it is the complement, it's a prepositional phrase. This means that the police are standing by this hole and actually looking into the hole. So they bent down maybe if they have to and they're looking through the fence. So you can see that ambiguity actually, it doesn't, doesn't take much to cause a lot of ambiguity. She is a Korean language teacher. Please analyze this two different ways, and when you're done, come back and we'll take a look at it. The ambiguity is all in how we apply the modifiers. So I won't even rewrite anything. But the complement in this sentence is a noun phrase. Teacher is the head. Now, it's possible that she is a teacher, determiner, a, Korean teacher. Maybe that's her origin. That's where she comes from. That's a noun phrase. Or maybe we could call it an adjective phrase, too, either way. And language teacher, noun phrase. So actually, she's a Korean teacher, and she's a language teacher. Maybe she teaches English, maybe she teaches French or Spanish. I really don't know. But I know that she's a Korean teacher, and she teaches language. Now, the other way to analyze it would be to keep teacher as the head. We don't have a choice with that. A uh, is the determiner. And now I use Korean language as one modifier. And when I rewrite it, I have language is the head, noun phrase, and Korean, we can call it an adjective phrase or a noun phrase. And she's a Korean language teacher. That's what kind of language she teaches. She teaches Korean language. Well, let's do another one, please. Analyze the sentence two different ways. Come back, and then we'll take a look together. Tonight's guest discusses sex with Jay Leno. So, Again, it's all in how we assign the modifiers and where we put these phrases. So, sex is the noun phrase, it's the object. And maybe the complement is Jay Leno. So, this person on the Jay Leno show is talking about sex, and she's talking about that topic with Jay Leno. Now, it's also possible that we can do it differently. And tonight's guest discuss, discusses sex with Jay Leno. It's the object. It's a noun phrase. And when we rewrite it, sex with Jay Leno, Leno, not Leno, I guess with Jay Leno, and now we see that if we analyze it this way, then she could be talking about sex with a number with anybody. We don't really know who she's talking about with, who she's talking about the subject with, but she's going to talk about having sex with Jay Leno. So this is her partner. Let's see, do we have any more? 
Oh, we do. We have a few more. Okay. I hope I'm not offending anybody. Hershey bars protest. Please. Is there two ways to analyze these three words? The answer is yes. The first way, Hershey bars pre-protest, Hershey does not bar protest, and Hershey is the subject, the verb is bars, and the object is protest. And so maybe they have guards outside their gate, they won't let anybody come, so they actually stop any kind of a protest going on. Now in the next sentence, Hershey bars protest, do Hershey bars protest? Hershey bars do not protest. And now Hershey bars is the subject. And it's the chocolate, the Hershey bars, that are actually doing the protesting. Like that. And this is our last one. Visiting relatives can be boring. Please. Stop the video, analyze this two different ways, and when you're ready, come back and we'll see two different meanings. Visiting relatives can be boring. Let's analyze it. No shifters. Oops. Can is the X word. Visiting relatives is the subject. Can ties that be present boring? Okay, and actually, why is uh, this is a tough one? Actually, it's a ing verb form, but we're using it like an adjective phrase. We could say very boring, quite boring. And so far, where's our ambiguity? Our ambiguity really lies here in the subject place. Now, if visiting relatives is a noun phrase, relatives is the head, and visiting is the verb phrase no time, and what this means is it means when relatives come to visit you, it can be boring. These relatives doing this action is boring. Now, the other way to analyze it, everything is the same, except when we analyze the subject, visiting relatives, we analyze it a little bit differently. We analyze it as a verb phrase with no time, where visiting is the verb, the particle place is empty, and the object is relatives, and the complement place is empty. And this means that when you go to visit relatives, or the action of visiting other people, your relatives, that's what can be boring. Here, it's the people that are boring. Here, it's the making of this action, doing this activity, is boring. And these are just some examples of how a structure can be ambiguous because it's possible to break up these sentences in different ways. And, you know, I wanted to show you this because not only is it interesting, but also it shows us that language is a very creative process where we bring a lot to the table and we bring a lot of meaning to the sentences that we hear and that we write. And, um, you know, there is a possibility for misunderstandings there. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found it interesting. And we have only one more lesson left to go. That's going to be our review lesson. We've covered 16 really different topics. I hope that you've enjoyed it. And I'll meet you back here shortly.